All right, so let's keep get going here. So, hi everyone. So uh, my name is uh, Shane Mailman. I'm the director of programs and operations at the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame. Uh, we are excited today to have our an Academy Award winning Haligonian Ben Brad Proudfoot with us today, live from Los Angeles, California. Um, it's really sunny here today in Nova Scotia, Ben, but I bet it's a little bit warmer where you are. Um, hopefully, a lot of the classes had an opportunity to watch his film, The Queen of Basketball. Um, between Ben and Lucy, we would need a lot more than 30 minutes to tell their stories, but I know that Bruce will make the most of the time we have, as always. Um, before I pass this off to Bruce, our Hall of Fame CEO and 10-time Olympic broadcaster, um, we're going to play a snippet of Ben's Oscar acceptance speech just to kind of kick it off. And I'll pass it off to you, Katie, to try to make that happen. And the Oscar goes to the Queen of Basketball. <laughs> oh, uh, th <laughs> uh, thank you to the Academy, uh, to my fellow nominees, uh, to the New York Times, uh, to Shaq, to Steph, Madison Wells, DNS, and everybody who helped make this film from Breakwater Studios. Uh, if there is anyone out there that still doubts whether there's an audience for female athletes, that still questions whether those stories are valuable or entertaining or important, let this Academy Award be the answer. All right, Bruce, I'm going to pass it off to you. I'm going to turn off my mic and everyone enjoy. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you on this Friday afternoon for being with us. This is a great way to end a week and head into the weekend. Uh, we've done a few of these. This is our first ever with an Academy Award winner. And, and Ben, before we kick in and talk more about the documentary, a lot of us on this call today, I'm sure, will try really hard to someday win an Academy Award. Odds are not all of us will. Can you tell me what is the feeling like when you're sitting in a crowd, you hear your name announced as a nominee, but then you hear your name announced as the winner of an Academy Award. Talk us through what that feeling is like. Wow. Uh, first of all, I'm just so happy to be here. And I just wanna say hello to everybody on this call out there back, in, back home in Nova Scotia. Hello, everybody. So nice for you all to be here. Happy Happy Friday afternoon. Um, it's it's an and to answer your question, it's it's an unbelievable feeling. It's totally surreal. I mean, it, it, it's uh, not anything you would ever expect to happen. You know, I'm I'm 32. I'm I'm very early in my career, um, so it was a it was a crazy and unexpected moment. But also as a documentary filmmaker you are making a film about someone else's story, in this case, Lucy Harris's story. So yes, I have the pleasure and honor of going up there and picking up the statue, but really I'm there on behalf of the film and on behalf of Lucy Harris. So, you know, my dad was a lawyer and I think it kind of feels like winning a case on behalf of a worthy client, you know? Um, because really that's, that's why the movie was significant and that's why the movie won was because of Lucy, uh, and her story. So it was, it was a beautiful layered experience. Listen, before we get to the questions from the kids and, and they're really good, as you might expect, I could I'd imagine. love you to name drop a few of your schools. Tell us about growing up in Nova Scotia and, and some of the schools you attended and a couple of memories along the way for you. Absolutely. So I, I will go going starting at the very beginning. I went to ch a, a preschool that was called Chestnut Street School. I don't know if it's still around. It was on Chestnut Street. And then my I went to primary grade one, grade two at Sacred Heart School of Halifax. And then I went from there to the grammar school. And then I went from the grammar school to uh, QEH. And we were there for the last couple of years of Queen Elizabeth High School, which is on the corner of, you know, at the end of Roby by that giant intersection in Quimple. 
Uh, and then they tore that down. And then we were the first graduating class of Citadel High. So that's, uh, those are all the schools that I went to. And there was, there are so many teachers along the way that meant so much to me and encouraged me. Teachers and other people, like there was this wonderful woman named Nancy Marshall who directed all the musicals at QEH. And she was one of the first people to encourage me to pursue a career in the arts. And I would not be here today without her. And that was all through the school system at, in Nova Scotia. One more quick one to set it up, then we'll get to the kids. I'd love to know, what's your earliest memory of either watching something on TV or in a theater and saying to yourself, you know, not only am I fascinated by the actors and actresses and the people that on the screen, but also I'm fascinated by how, how this was put together and I might want to do this for a living. What's your earliest memory? Yeah, that's a great question. I have two memories that come to mind. One is going to see the movie Mrs. Doubtfire <laughs> at, <laughs> at the Oxford Theater for my sister's birthday. And just loving it and all my sister's friends laughing and loving the movie and the whole theater was packed and I really, I was like, wow, this is an incredible, I, I, that was my first movie theater experience. And then the other thing I remember, my sister, was, I have an older sister, six years older, and she was in Halifax dance, learning ballet. And she was uh, in the production of The Nutcracker that was at the Rebecca Cohn Theater uh, every year. And there's this amazing giant puppet, like Father Christmas, like it's like 30 feet tall that comes out in the Nutcracker at the Rebecca Cone. And I remember what my, me and my mom going to pick up my sister or something and looking down and they were practicing this huge puppet in one of the squash courts. And I could see all the people that were moving the puppet around and I was like, oh my gosh, how do I, I want to do that. And I, I think that's, that made a big impression on me that, you know, there was this amazing sort of circus of people who could entertain, uh, you know, this big group of people and that, that got me hooked. You know, Ben, we've done these, um, I think seven or eight times now, maybe more. And it, the same thing happens every time. I always prepare some questions that I think will be good to get us through the session. And then the kids send them in and they're better. So I just rely on the kids to carry us from here on forward, okay? And right. this question was asked in a variety of ways, but it was asked pretty clearly from kids at Forest Ridge Academy and Sir Charles Tupper Elementary. And it's basically this question. How did you get your inspiration slash idea for the documentary, The Queen of Basketball? It's a great question. Shout out to those two schools. Um, the inspiration came from reading about Lucy's story and realizing that no documentary had been made about her. Realizing that there were so few photos of her when I Googled her, there was no footage of her playing, that her name, which is, which is L-U-S-I-A, Lucia, was often misspelled as Louisa all over the internet. So here is someone who has this incredible legacy who had accomplished so much in her career that no one could even touch many of the records, but she wasn't getting the respect that I thought she deserved. And this is as someone like, I don't know very much about basketball at all, but I know that, you know, first and only woman drafted to the NBA and the first person to score a basket in women's Olympics is a significant person. And so the inspiration came from that huge gap that I saw between the significance of Lucy Harris and how the public saw her or didn't see her really in this case. And I knew that a really good documentary could close that gap and bring her story to the world. And, you know, we spent the next two years working to close the gap and we're still working to close that gap. That's, that's the inspiration for us. Okay, so from Ridgecliff Middle School, there were a lot of kids that were curious about this one. And it's because a couple of their heroes worked with you on this. How did you get in contact with Shaquille O'Neal and Stephen Curry, or did they get in contact with you? How did that happen? How did it happen? It's a good, good question. So we had made the film. The first one was Shaq. And he watched the film and he reached out to us and said, how can I help? And it's kind of one of those crazy emails, like, 
is this real? <laughs> is this a real email from Shaq himself? <laughs> um, and it was. And, you know, we jumped on the phone and he was extremely supportive and he was just moved. He was moved by her story and he had the same feeling like, I can't believe I don't know this person. And then it was later in the in the process. I had known uh, a friend of mine, Brian, who I went to film school with at the University of Southern California, worked with uh, at Stephen Curry's production company. And so he knew about the film. And then as we were getting, you know, going later in the process to promote the film, Steph said, how can I help? And he joined forces with Shaq. And, you know, it was kind of like the Avengers <laughs> came together and lifted Lucy up on their shoulders. And of course, you know, Steph had an incredible year and the world was paying attention. And so could not have been a better, um, more generous group of executive producers. And I'm still pinching myself that I even was on the same team. It's the only time I'll be on the same team as people, people like that. So it was a very, very special experience. What well, were there moments where the three of you were in a room together? And did you get to know these guys in person at all? Or? Well, you have to remember, it's, this was all happened like pretty deep pandemic when all of this was coming together. So in, in a Zoom room, many, yeah, many times I got to interview them over Zoom. A lot of phone calls. The first phone call I received after I won the Oscar was from Shaquille O'Neal um, to congratulate me. It was, you know, unknown name, unknown number. I picked it up. <laughs> it's Shaq. Um, so yeah, there's there's been a lot of wonderful uh, wonderful get-togethers, and both both of them are just stellar individuals and great people. And I think that's why they signed on. They wanted to you know, lift up someone else, in this case, Lucy. From the grade six class at Hawthorne Elementary School, what was the biggest challenge in making this film? The biggest challenge, you know, there's, there's a lot of skepticism about whether or not female athletes should deserve the stage as much as male athletes. And there was a lot of that kind of pushback when we were trying to get the film out there, which obviously is baloney, but it's that idea exists. And so we were, we were always pushing up against that. And it was, it was there the whole time of like, I'm not sure if people want to care about this story that happened 50 years ago. And, you know, people don't watch the WNBA and this and that. And this is like a completely misogynist point of view. And so we were constantly pushing against that and taking that down as a silly uh, outlook that needed to be challenged and that we felt that our movie challenged. And so, you know, that's why I said that in my speech, because I felt like winning the award put an end to all of those people's arguments and doubts and cynicism. Um, and that was that was a great triumph for our team. With a, with a sports documentary, I guess there are two ways you can do them. And Amber Hilt's class is curious about this. You could have a narrator, some man or woman with a big voice that's reading script and going to clips of Lucy Harris, or you can let Lucy Harris narrate her own story. So I guess the question is, at what point did you realize that Lucy Harris was going to be your narrator and the host of her own documentary here? Right. I see the Amber Hiltz class right there. There they are, waving their hands. There they are. <laughs> um, well, that is that is the style of documentaries that I like to make. Um, and I think that uh, documentary filmmakers often underestimate how good of a storyteller other people are. They think they're the ones that know how to tell a good story and how to put it together. And of course, we help uh, craft and put it together. But at the end of the day, you know, human beings are great oral storytellers. Uh, we all tell each other stories all day long. And so when I met Lucy, I was like, man, you know, she's an amazing, charming, wonderful storyteller. And with a little bit of editing, you know, we can we can bring the magic of her story together into a 20 minute film. And who better to tell the story than than Lucy herself? So I always try, if I can, to have it come from the horse's mouth, so to speak. There were a lot of great moments where you just let the camera linger on her and let her 
face make an expression, right? She had a very, very expressive face that was perfect for this, wasn't it? Definitely. Yeah. And she, she's just so charming. I mean, she has that contagious giggle that is so memorable and lovely. Yeah. You know, Ben, a lot of, a lot of kids noticed and they're eagle eyed, these young people that uh, she appeared in this. And when you went to wide shot, she was in a wheelchair. Yes. And, and before we ask how she passed away, because she knows she has passed away, what, what happened to her later in life that, that led her to the wheelchair? You know, as she explained, I asked her that question. She just, she said she had bad knees. I'm sure, I'm sure playing basketball did not help, but she was tall. I mean, obviously tall. And she, you know, she, she worked her knees hard and she had bad knees. Her sister had had knee replacements and there was a complication and her sister had passed away. So she was very reluctant to get any kind of surgery on her knees. So that's why she was in a wheelchair. Um, but honestly, her, when she passed, it was a bit of a mystery. I mean, we don't, I don't, we don't really know what exactly happened. She went into the hospital for a treatment and, you know, what, I, I'm, we're not, we don't know what happened, but she passed away suddenly. Uh, yeah, the students at RMS were curious about that. And there, there is, a, I, I kind of tried to research this myself. There's nobody really knows, do they? Nobody, re I don't know. And I don't know if the family knows. I think it was pretty sudden and um, she was get, getting some arthritis medication. So uh, hopefully we figured out what happened to put the family's mind at ease. But um, yeah, we don't know. I want to go back to, uh, to Hawthorne for a second. Here's a, a great little question from Luella. Hope Luella's watching. Luella. Yeah. Just what's your favorite part of the Lucy Harris story? My favorite part of the Lucy Harris story. I mean, I, the part the part that I love the most that's in the movie is when they win the first championship at the AIAW, you know, when they were up against the the Catholic school and they had no chance and they were, you know, they had won this championship three times. And here's this school from the Mississippi Delta with Lucy in the lead. Nobody's ever heard of them. And they win this great championship and it sort of rockets her to stardom. That, that's my favorite part of the story in the past. But it's also hard to beat the part of the story, which is now part of her story, where, you know, three months after she passes away, her story wins the Academy Award with her, all of her four children and their spouses at the Dolby Theater in Hollywood cheering. And I mean, that's a pretty amazing cherry on top of what was an incredible life lived. I know you didn't get into a big list of her stats in these games, but if you ever want to Google her kids, like Ben, she was putting up in key games, 47 points and 18 rebounds or 35 and 12, like her number, she was very, very dominant on the basketball court, wasn't she? Yeah, very much so. And I, I and intentionally I, didn't put the statistics in there because I don't know anything about basketball. <laughs> so, you know, you could say, you know, 30 or 60 or 150, I wouldn't know the difference. So I tried to make this movie for absolutely everyone, regardless of how much they knew about sports. Um, but yeah, I encourage anyone who's interested to look up her statistics and, and be blown away because that's, that's, as I understand it, she's pretty impressive uh, track record. Here's a very thoughtful question from the grade six students at Kennard Junior High. It's Hosking, I believe, is the teacher. I hope they're on the call. It's, it's kind of three-pronged, and we'll do it one each here. How do you feel the success of your film benefits women? Well, I think it just goes to show that, you know, there's, an, there's amazing, amazing stories out there of women athletes that we need to all be paying attention to. So I hope that it, it benefits women in that, um, you know, Lucy's story, which was always there. You know, we didn't create the story. The story was always there. But now many more people get to see it. All of us get to see it. Millions of people around the world get to see it. And everybody has a better context and understanding of what has happened in the past. And I think when you think about athletes and you think about, you know, the WNBA versus the NBA and, you know, how do we get more viewership? We all love storytelling, right? We're, we're all thinking about peop other people in terms of a story. 
And so we know the story of the famous male basketball players because it's been told to us by on the TV and in the newspaper and on our phones, but we don't necessarily know the story of female basketball players or athletes or women in general. And so my hope is, is that this film is part of a much larger growing chorus to spend more time and attention telling the stories of women, both in the past and the present, so that we can become invested in what they're doing and what stories you know, they're living out and moving forward on the day to day. And that's going to bring equity to not only sports, but all measures of society. And so I'm proud that we had one little uh, contribution to that change. Yeah, you, I think, might have just taken a good whirl at this one, but they also want to know how you feel the success of your film benefits Black communities. Yeah, I mean, it's it's honestly a, a similar a, a similar answer, which is that the narrative, the narrative, uh, the narrative of both female uh, history and Black history and Black female history has been completely under served underfunded um, and moved out of the spotlight. And it's up to us as storytellers to enable filmmakers from those communities and storytellers who know those stories and bring them center stage like Lucy did to tell her own story. Um, and I think it's, you know, if you, if you wanna ask the question, why didn't we know Lucy's story? Why were there 50 tapes and cans of film that were in the back corner of an archive in the Mississippi Delta that no one had ever cataloged or digitized. The answer to that question is fundamentally linked with the fact that she was a black woman in the in the Mississippi Delta. If she was a white man, there would have been a documentary made in 1977, you know, when all this was happening. And so it's 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 a really important thing to understand for all of us to understand. It's not that these stories didn't happen. It's that they haven't been told. And that's, it's incumbent upon us to, to rectify that. A lot of kids did their homework regarding you <laughs> and they were tickled by the notion that as a kid, you were a magician. Tell us about <laughs> your, your early days as a magician. That's coming from a whole spectrum of schools. They're fascinated by that. Well, it's true. So when I was, when I was in, in elementary and middle school, I was the magician. So I would be terrorizing the whole classroom doing tricks, all the teachers despised me because I was distracting everybody with card tricks and coin tricks. I had so many decks of cards confiscated from me. Um, but yeah, I was really into, I was really into doing magic tricks and kind of learned my way around, uh, around school and making friends by doing magic tricks for, for my friends. Um, so that is definitely true after school recess, lunchtime, doing a lot of magic tricks for my teachers and friends. Do you have a magic stage name? Do you have a, a moniker? You know, Ben Proudfoot was pretty memorable, uh, so I didn't have to, but a lot of people thought that that was my stage name, even though <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. So back to Sir Charles Tupper for a second. Uh, this is a great question for everybody on the call. I, I am sure, Ben, there are many kids watching right now that are hearing you and saying, man, that would be a really cool life to have. What's the advice you give to aspiring younger generations of filmmakers? My, my advice is that if you want to be a filmmaker, you can do it. If you want to make a piece of art that changes the world, you can do it. If you set your mind to it, and if you, you know, invest in building up your skills slowly at first, baby steps at first, and but keeping your eye on the ball of what you dream of doing, whether it's filmmaking or whether it's, you know, whatever you care about that you truly believe is important, that you really like doing, that makes you really glad to do, whatever it is, you can do it. And you can do it from Nova Scotia and you can go stay in Nova Scotia and do it in Nova Scotia. You can go around the world. You can go around the world and come back. Everything is possible. And I've had a really lucky life where I've been able to go to California and make films and be able to go back and spend time with my family and as a documentarian travel around the world. And it's so much fun. It's a really, I couldn't imagine a better life 
Um, but whatever it is that you dream of, know that it is in, within your power to achieve that, no matter where you come from or anyone in your life who's telling you that it may not be possible. Follow your dreams and they will come true with time. Yeah. A couple of, I guess, time for a couple of more questions. One just came in here and it's a good one from the Walter Duggan School and it's grade 6JM. Do you think your film will make women's basketball more popular? And it's pretty popular now. The WNBA is doing really well, but do you think your film will add to that? I hope it's a little, little drop in the sea, you know? I hope so. Um, you know, I think there was probably 10, 15 million people watching the Oscars that night, so that's good. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not one film or one story or one filmmaker that's going to make the difference. It's a lot of raindrops that are going to create this big tidal wave that will change the world. And so I think probably it, it helps a little bit. You know, I know, I know that, I know that uh, you know, Lucy has inspired millions of people and, you know, it's really that ripple effect that um, will make women's basketball more popular, but that's gonna happen on its own because it should be more popular anyway. Um, you know, I think this just lifts up the curtain a little bit on where, where the story started that makes people understand what's happened, you know? Where do you keep your Academy Awards? I, I, I am so sad that I didn't bring it to my office today I because I would have loved to show it to everybody. Um, but I, it's at my house in my dining room on a little table. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would have shown it to you all very proudly, but I don't have it with me this morning. You know what? You, you win the award for best conversation piece at a dinner then, right? Nobody <laughs> else has one of those, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. And anytime anyone has any notes or they want to change the movie, I just set it right down and say, say can you say that again? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah. So, it's so a the last one. For, yeah, for the kids that, that, that Googled you and, and wanted to know all about you. Uh, last one for you, Ben. What are you working on now? And when do you anticipate that we'll be able to see what you're working on now? So I actually have two new projects. And you can watch them both right now on YouTube for free. One is called Mink, which is about a woman named Patsy Mink. And actually for the eagle-eyed people out there, there's a photo of Patsy Mink in the Queen of Basketball. She was a Congresswoman in the United States. She was the first Congresswoman of color. And she wrote and defended the legislation called Title IX which is a really important legislation that prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex, which is why there was a basketball team for Lucy Harris to play, play on. And if you look really closely, there's actually a clip of Lucy Harris in that film. It's called Mink, M-I-N-K. And then the other film is called The Best Chef in the World. And it's about a woman named Sally Schmidt, who is an amazing chef. If anyone out there loves food, this is a food movie. And she was the godmother of California cuisine, which is famous cuisine of fresh seasonal ingredients. And she started a restaurant called the French Laundry, which is a world famous restaurant. And so it's about her and she tells her story of how she started this food movement. And that's also available on YouTube on the New York Times YouTube page. Do you, uh, do you get home much from Nova Scotia? Yeah, I, you know, during the pandemic, it was awfully hard to get across the border, but I, I did get back a few times. And uh, I was back uh, just a couple months ago to see my mom and uh, I brought the I brought the Academy Award back and we had a little reception, which was a lot of fun. But I usually get back two or three times a year, my mom uh, to see my mom and my family. Well, clearly, we're all really proud of you here. Congrats on a uh, remarkable a year. Yeah, listen, and 140 classes a day, multiply that safely by 20, I guess. That's the thousands of kids who have heard your story today, and that makes us really excited and happy. I'm going to turn it back to Shane, but Ben, on behalf of our Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame, I know it's kind of early there, 9 in the morning for a filmmaker. Thanks for making the time, and we wish you nothing but the best uh, in the days ahead, okay? Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so yeah, on behalf of all of us, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, as a as a lifelong movie fan, the idea of winning an Academy Award like like blows <laughs> my mind. So 
anyway, congratulations on that. And just as note, like we have friends at the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they've told me that Lucy was an amazing person. So again, thanks for telling her story to the world. So, so again, thanks, Ben, for uh, taking the time. I'd like to thank your, uh, your EA Nana for taking a million emails for me to make this happen. Um, thanks, Bruce, for doing an amazing job as usual. Thanks for all the teachers, to all the teachers for signing up for this and uh, allowing your students to hear Ben's story. And again, thanks to the students who participated on a Friday afternoon. So have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, stay tuned for our next Hero Chat in the very near future. See you later, everyone. Great weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. Have fun. <laughs> 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 oh man. Bye. Ben, you were excellent, man. You were just excellent. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you guys. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh my God. Bye. 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 B